So today what I wanted to talk about was building mental models of our networked world. And I'm going to focus a lot on the human cognitive process. How do humans build models of the world? And why is that important? Well, it tends to be important because if we don't have accurate models of the world, then we respond inappropriately and we could potentially um, miss out on survival, for example. So building accurate models of our world is really important to us. It's also really important for us to um, interact with one another as social beings. So in terms of our communication uh, and in terms of our sort of inner mental life. So there are lots of reasons why building an accurate model of the world is important, but we don't really understand a lot about how that happens. So the talk in the talk today, what I'm going to try to do is to show you how network science can really help us to understand how humans build models of the world. And before I get uh, too in depth, I just wanted to mention that my lab is called the Complex Systems Lab um, at, and it sits at the University of Pennsylvania and we work in a range of different problems. So we work from collective human behavior to granular and particulate networks. We do a little bit of work in control of brain networks. We have some um, studies of control in mechanical systems. Uh, we study network conservation and evolution, and we study learning and network behaviors. And these might sound really sort of disparate, but probably as you're seeing from this workshop, the tools of network science and the way of thinking about problems can actually be really helpful. And you can um, cross fertilize between different disciplines using the same uh, conceptual approaches. So each of these pieces has actually informed the others in a very meaningful way. What I'm going to be focusing on today is this bottom right uh, section, learning and network behaviors. <clears throat> and as I um, begin sort of my remarks in this section, I wanted to tell you a story that's actually recounted in Robert McFarlane's book called Landmarks, which is a book about language and landscape. And he recalls inviting Roger Deakin, who is an English writer and documentary maker on waterways, to Cambridge University, where McFarland was uh, currently studying. And his hope was that Roger would come and give an amazing talk and impress all of his friends, and that hopefully then they would think very well of McFarland. So that, that was kind of the, the goal of the invitation. Um, but he remembers what happens as being quite different than the expectation. So he says, I stared dedicatedly at my shoes, embarrassed that my friend was failing to perform in front of my academic peers. It was only later that I realized it wasn't a failure to perform, but a refusal to conform. Cambridge seminars expect rigor and logic from their speakers, a braced subtlety of exposition and explanation, tested proofs of cause and consequence. But water, which was Roger's subject, doesn't do rigor in that sense, and neither did Roger, though his writing was often magnificently precise in his poetry. For Roger, water flowed fast and wildly through culture. It was protean, it was slip shape, and so that was how he followed it. Slipshod and ship shape at once, moving from a word here to an idea there, pursuing water's influence too fast for his notes or his audience to keep up with, joining his watery subjects by means of an invisible network of tunnels and drains. And I love so much about this passage, um, but what I really wanted to call your attention to is that last section. So here is Roger giving a very flowing, turbulent, uh, tunnely, drainy kind of talk um, and sort of indicating the architecture of his subject in the way that he was speaking. It's not just that he was accurately describing water, he was actually speaking in a watery way. And the way that water works is by networks of tunnels and drains. And so this passage sort of makes me think about a lot of things. It makes me think how much of knowledge is a network? Is it just, you know, UK waterways that have a network of knowledge behind them? Or is this something more generic? And actually, if you go back through the literature and the history of science, the idea that knowledge is a network has been around for a while. So for example, from Henri Poincaré's 1905 Science and Hypothesis, he writes, the aim of science is not things themselves as the dogmatists in their simplicity imagine, but the relations among things. Outside these relations, there is no reality knowable. So really highlighting the fact that relationships between concepts is very important for understanding science. But I think um, from Dewey's 1916 Democracy and Education, he really uh, addresses it more head on, where he says, um, knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. Thus, we get at a new event indirectly instead of immediately by invention, ingenuity, and resourcefulness. An ideally perfect knowledge 
would represent such a network of interconnections that any past experience would offer a point of advantage from which to get at the problem presented in a new experience. So again, suggesting that the perfect knowledge is a network of interconnections, perfect knowledge of anything. And in fact, that set of interconnections allows us to use our prior experiences to address current problems. So the passage from um, McFarland's landmarks not just doesn't just suggest that knowledge might be a network, which is sort of upheld by prior work in the history of science, but also that knowledge is a network that can be learned by example, can be perceived by example. So Roger's audience perceived the network architecture of UK waterways from the way that he was speaking. And this draws to my mind the question of how do I speak to a class of students at Penn. So when I'm, when I'm teaching a linear algebra class, for example, I am trying to translate a set of ideas to the class. And those 15 ideas are not independent ideas, they're connected ideas, right? And they're connected in a particular way. So imagine that those 15 ideas that I want to transmit to a class look like this network on the left-hand side, a very highly modular network. My goal as a lecturer is to take that information and translate it linearly <clears throat> Why linearly? Well, because time is one dimensional and unidirectional. So I need to take this potentially high dimensional object, map it into one in the one dimensional of time in a way that maximizes the students learning. How do I do that? How do any of us do that? We all do that when we're communicating. So I think there's a couple sub problems here that I'd like to call your attention to. This is how I think about the global structure. So on the left hand side is the brain of the speaker or writer that has a particular network architecture in their minds of what it is they want to communicate. They have the challenge of optimally mapping that architecture into the one dimension of time by stringing concepts out in time in such a way that the brain of the listener or reader, which is over on the right hand side, can optimally reconstruct from the line what the high dimensional network object was. So there's a problem of mapping, and then there's a problem of construction. So I think it's kind of amazing that this, both of these sound quite difficult. I mean, in fact, reconstructing something high dimensional from 1D sounds like magic. Um, but we as humans tend to do this all the time. And in fact, although I've been describing this as being relevant for giving a lecture, the more basic problem of inferring patterns of pairwise dependencies from incoming streams of data, one dimensional streams of data, is actually what allowed us to learn language when we were infants. It also allows us to segment visual events, to parse tonal groupings, to parse spatial scenes, to infer social networks around us, and to perceive distinct concepts. So it's actually a capacity that humans have and use all of the time. But how do they do it? To answer the question of how they do it, we need to have an experimental setup that will allow us to show somebody information that has a particular network architecture, but push it into 1D and then ask how the person sees the network. Do they see the network? So what we did is that we decided to build a little graph like this one, and we let every um, stimulus, which could be a word or an image or a movement, be a node inside of this graph. And then every edge in the graph indicates an allowable transition between nodes. So I can move from node 14 to node 15 in my stream of information, but I can't move directly from node 14 to node 2 because there's no direct link between them. So each of these edges inside of the graph indicates an allowable transition. Now what we can do is we can say, well, how do we take this network and create and, and smoosh it into one dimension? Well, we can do that by creating a sequence of stimuli by taking a random walk on this graph. And a rat, we could take lots of different kinds of walks, but I'm going to focus on a random graph or random walk for today. So at every node, we have a chance of walking across any of the four edges that come out of that node. And we have an equal probability of, of crossing any of those four. So that allows us to create a stream of information um, in 1D. Now, at every single stimulus, we require the human participant to perform a little task so that we can measure their time to react. And the idea is that if they react quickly, to that little task, it means they were expecting that edge and have learned that edge in the graph. They were ready for it and they could respond immediately. 
If on the other hand, they respond very slowly to the little task, then that suggests that they were not expecting that transition and therefore have not learned that edge in the graph. So this setup allows us to probe how the network is being learned, it, at what time points are each of the sections being learned, etc. So we can use that same kind of experimental setup to study um, motion, to study vision, to study social networks, all kinds of things. What I'm going to focus on today is the motor version of the task because it's a little bit easier to explain, but I'm happy to talk about the others in the question and answer period if useful. So an example of the motor version of this task is to it, um, we show people five boxes. So as you see over here on the left hand side, there's five boxes, one or two of them are highlighted in red. And that tells you which fingers of, uh, to press on a keyboard. So this says press the fifth finger, so I'll press my pinky. The next one says press one and three, so I'll press one and three. Next one says press three and four, then press five, then press two, then press one and four. So the sequence of movements is defined by taking a random walk on a transition graph. And um, by the humans responding with the motor movement, we can see how long it took them to respond and therefore how well they were learning the graph. All right, so first, before I show you what we found, I want to ask the simple question of what do we already know about this problem? So from the work in the field of statistical learning and the study of artificial grammars, we know that humans are very sensitive to transition probabilities. So if you're sitting in an environment where event A is commonly followed by event B, then whenever A happens, you anticipate B is going to happen. So when I smell delicious cookies, I anticipate eating cookies because usually eating cookies happy, happens after smelling the cookies, right? Whereas um, if event A only 25% of the time um, follows is uh, precedes event C, I'll expect C a little bit, but I'll expect it three times less than I expect B. Okay, so as we're experiencing the world, we experience many different transition probabilities and we can um, respond and change our expectations appropriately. Now, a, um, in a corollary to that is that if you are sitting in an environment where A um, creates two possible outcomes or has two possible outcomes, you'll expect them both about 50% of the time. And because there's only two, you will have high certainty about what's coming next and you'll respond relatively quickly. If on the other hand, you live in a world where event A has 14 different outcomes, that's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know which of the 14 is going to happen. It's harder for you to prepare 14 different responses. And so therefore you're frequently slower in responding to that event. So let's just double check that our experiments upholds the, these known capacities of humans before we get into testing things that are not yet known. Okay, so here what we have along the y-axis is the reaction time of human participants. And then along the x-axis is the entropy, the local entropy of the environment. So when an event only has one possible outcome, the entropy is zero and the reaction time is very fast, almost 850 milliseconds, so very swift. Whereas um, if they're in part of the environment where there are 14 different outcomes, they respond very slowly. So their reaction time is up here closer to 1000 milliseconds. And there's a parametric relationship, as you can see, between human reaction times and the local entropy of that event in the graph, which is defined by simply the degree of the node that they are currently sitting in. So if the degree is one, they respond very quickly. If the degree is 14, they respond very slowly. And from this line, if you fit a line to these data points, you can see that humans are processing one bit of information every 32 milliseconds inside of this task, which I think is kind of mind blowing. It's really, really interesting, I think. I want to know whether that slope, that 32 milliseconds per bit, is something that's consistent across age. So if we study youth as they go through development, um, or if we study individuals who have um, uh, different psychiatric conditions or neurological disorders are is this slope altered um, so that's open an open question right now in the literature uh, that i think we'd be really excited to um, address 
Okay, but so so humans are sensitive to the entropy of the local entropy of the environment inside of the graph, and that was known, but at least our experiments show it too. So that means that we're we're probing, you know, um, valid human behavior. But what we actually find really excitingly is that human reactions depend on more than entropy. And to show you that, I want to call your attention to this same graph, but I want you to notice something different about it. This graph is a K4 regular graph, which means that every node has exactly degree four. What does that mean? Well, that means that when you're sitting at a node, you have a 25% chance of flowing along any of the four connections that come out of it, which means that the transition probabilities are all the same. Every single edge inside of this graph has exactly the same transition probability. So if humans were just sensitive to entropy, just sensitive to the local degree of, the, of where they're sitting in the graph, their reactions to all of this network should be the same. But what we actually find is that humans slow appreciably at this cross-cluster boundary. So the color that I am plotting here is the human reaction time. So dark blue means that they are responding relatively quickly and bright yellow means they're responding relatively slowly. So humans are responding really quickly inside of the module and they're responding very slowly between modules. That is unexpected. That, that, is, that means that people are not focusing on the local information in the, in the um, environment. They're somehow appreciating the mesoscale architecture, the sort of global organization of their environment. And that global organization is altering their responses. So we dug a little bit further and said, well, you know, it's a modular graph. So maybe humans are just doing something like category learning. Humans are very good at, at assuming categories. So maybe the humans are just taking five elements and assuming it's a category. The next five elements assume that's a category. The third five elements assume that's a category. If that were the case, then we would expect that there would be no difference in reaction time inside of a module. Every edge inside of a module should have the same reaction time. But what we actually find is that humans are really swift at responding to this internal triangle I've colored in blue on the left hand side of this slide. And they're sort of middling in responding to the purple lines and they're slowest in responding to this red cross cluster transition. So what that suggests is that humans are not performing category learning. They're not clumping five things together. They're actually sensitive to a hierarchy inside of the modular graph. And just to put the data um, in front of you to support that statement, along the y-axis here is the difference in reaction time between the boundary edges, which are colored in purple, and the internal edges, which we've colored in blue. And then the second uh, bar is the difference in reaction time between the cross cluster edges in red and the boundary edges. And the largest difference is obviously between the cross cluster edges in red and the internal edges in blue. But the um, really important one was this first one, the difference between the boundary edges and the blue edges. That indicates to us that they are sensitive to hierarchy inside of the graph itself. And the last thing that we noticed is that humans are sensitive not just to entropy, and not just a hierarchy, but also to the overarching topology of the network. So we showed humans these three different networks. Well, actually, they never see the networks. They only see the stream of information, right? They only see the stream of stimuli. But what we see is that humans respond much more swiftly when we show them information on a modular graph, like this purple one on the left-hand side. And then they're on average 31 milliseconds slower in responding to information presented on a lattice graph. And then they're another 24 milliseconds slower in responding to information presented on this K4 random graph. So what that indicates is that there are some global architectures that humans seem to prefer in learning. And the modular architecture is the one that um, produces the swiftest reaction times on average. So together, these results reveal that humans process information beyond entropy in a manner that depends systematically on the network topology. Now, to motivate the next set of questions in this um, scheme, I wanted to read to you this passage from Arthur Benskin's book called Ruskin, A Study in Personality. So this is about John Ruskin, the um, uh, uh, painting critic. So he says, you know how most of us in idle moments, or perhaps even more in moments when we are officially supposed to be occupied, lapse into a reverie in which a stream of thought, it may be placid, it may be vehement, sweeps through the brain from the flushed reservoir of the mind. 
Suppose you check yourself suddenly in one of those reveries. Try to put down in words what you have been thinking of and as you thought it. You will find it to be ludicrously impossible. Half the thoughts have passed without clothing themselves in any vesture of word. One thing has suggested another, often enough by some trivial similarity of superficial form. The whole thing is evasive, elusive, and irrecoverable. This is a common feeling that I have. Um, but as I was reading this passage, I thought, you know, what is happening in the human's minds as they're going through this task? What are they thinking? What are they not thinking? Um, and how are they taking each of these pieces of information and forming that perception of the network behind the information? So let's ask it. What are people thinking? Well, let's come up with a simple um, computational model and then test some of its predictions. Here is our little human participant, and they're experiencing a set of nodes in time. And in order to build an expectation of the transition probability matrix, they have to observe what's currently in front of them. So that's node X of T plus one. That's what's currently in front of them. And they have to remember what just happened. So that's X of T. They have to have both of these pieces in their minds in order to build an expectation of the transition probability. Um, so let's just suppose that humans are doing something like maximum likelihood estimation. If that were the case, then they would be building a counts matrix like this. So n sub ij is the number of times they've seen node i go to node j, and then you would divide that by the number of times they've seen i go to anything. This would give them an average appreciation of the transition probabilities between i and j. So I'm going to call this a hat mle for maximum likelihood estimation. Um, the nice thing about this computational model is that it provides an unbiased estimate of the transition structure. It directly creates the transition probability matrix. But the fact that humans' reaction times depend systematically on these abstract global features of the network marks a clear deviation from maximum likelihood estimation. They're not doing maximum likelihood estimation, right? Um, and we could tell that when we saw the slowing at the cross cluster boundary, when really all the transition probabilities are the same. So they should be reacting the same to the whole, every edge, right? And they didn't. So what we do now is that we posit that the human brain is attempting to maximize the accuracy of their performance, but also minimize computational complexity. So we want to get the A, but we want to do it with as little effort as possible. Okay. And this computation between accuracy and computational complexity leads to a maximum entropy or minimum complexity model of people's internal representations of events. So just to put a little bit of a few equations behind that, and then I'll give you a picture for what that does. We can write down the probability of recalling not x of t truthfully, but something else in the past, like x of t minus delta t as what just happened. So this is, this is an error. This is you were distracted for a moment and didn't see something. And so what you remember as happening is actually something that happened several moments ago. That's delta t ago. Then we can write down the error of the candidate probability distribution as e of q, which is just going to be our q um, function here times delta t. And then we can write down the complexity of the error distribution simply as the entropy. So minus s of q is the entropy of q, and that's going to be q of delta t times log of q of delta t. And then we can call upon the free energy principle to write down the total cost of the distribution as its free energy f, which is going to be equal to the error of the candidate probability distribution minus um, the entropy. And this beta value here is a variable that is um, consistent with the temperature. So the distribution that minimizes that free energy is the Boltzmann distribution, um, where beta is the, the inverse temperature parameter. So now I want to give you a picture for what that all means in, in the kind of model that a human is building inside of their mind. The first sort of benchmark I want to give you is that what happens when somebody's beta is zero? That means that they have an equal probability of remembering anything in the past as the uh, precursor to what they're currently seeing. So that means that they build a fully connected network in their head. Every node is connected to every other node. There's no structure in this network. It means any event could lead to any other event. I mean, if you have that kind of model of your world, I'm sure you're very anxious. Um, on the right-hand side, this is somebody who has 
um, perfect memory, but they're also maximizing mental resources. So their um, probability of remembering the previous moment is a delta function on zero. So they remember exactly what happened in the previous moment and every single time they remember exactly what happened. So this is a perfect memory person, but they're also maximizing computational resources. The model that they build in their head is the perfect model. It is the network where every edge has a transition probability of 25 or 0.25. Now, what about somebody in between? Somebody who doesn't have a perfect memory, but also doesn't completely minimize mental resources. They do something you know, in the middle. So this is when um, the beta is equal to about one. They're likely to remember something recent as what's driving what they're currently seeing, and they're less likely to remember something in the deeper past. So your, your probability of remembering something in the past falls off with time. And so with that kind of function, a memory function in your mind, you would build a transition probability matrix like this. So you would strengthen these edges that happen in between nodes inside of a module, and these uh, edges that uh, go between modules would actually be relatively weak, consistent with the slowing that we see here on this cross-cluster edge in the actual human behaviors. And the reason that that, that that is happening is because when people are taking, when we're showing people a random walk on this graph, they end up spending consecutive time points inside of a module. And so even if they um, slightly rearrange the connections inside of the module, it's still going to strengthen everything nearby. They don't spend a lot of consecutive time on the cross cluster edge. And so they never end up strengthening that. And so that leads to this asymmetry where they strengthen the edges inside of a module and weaken the edge between them. So now we can go back to our data and we can say, well, you know, can we fit that model to the human participants and can we see what kind of beta values humans show? So in 358 new participants, we found that there were 71 individuals whose beta values we couldn't distinguish from zero, so the completely disordered. Uh, organization. And then there were 44 individuals whose beta values we couldn't distinguish from infinity. But the vast majority of people, so 243 individuals, had beta values that were in this middling range with a mean of 0.31 and a median of 0.06. So this, this type that, that is um, strengthening the connections inside of the modules and weakening the ones in between. We can also ask, you know, what beta value would humans need to have shown for us to be able to detect this slowing at the cross cluster boundary. So I'm showing you here on the left hand side different beta values and then I'm showing you the difference between the expected transition probabilities within a module, A within, versus between modules, so A between. And if you look at that ratio, it is maximized at these middling beta values. So we are actually somewhat lucky that humans on average have these middling beta values that even allowed us to detect this effect and allowed us to have something to explain. And similarly, you can ask the question of which beta values would have allowed us to see a difference between the modular graph when humans respond there versus the lattice graph. Remember I told you that they're much faster in responding to the modular graph? Well, what kind of beta values would humans need to have for us to have even detected that? And the answer is again, this, these middling values of beta. So here is the expected transition probability on a modular graph versus on a lattice graph. So A modular versus A hat mod lattice. And you can see that that ratio is maximized at these middling values of beta. Um, okay, so now what I want to say is, you know, when you have built a computational theory of a human behavior, you typically want to do three things. The first thing is that you want to estimate the parameters from real data, which is what we just did. We want that we took our model, we fit it to real data, and we said, what kind of beta values do humans show? Um, now, the next thing that we want to do is to validate the mechanism of our model. Right? And then the third thing that you typically want to do is to use the theory to make a prediction about a new experiment. These are the typical things that you would want to do once you've built a computational theory. Right. So while we've done number one, I want to walk you through numbers two and three next. So first, let's validate the mechanism of the phenomenological theory. To validate the mechanism, we have to have an understanding of what the human memory distribution looks like. How likely is it for us to remember something in the past? And how does that likelihood fall off with distance in the past? 
Does it have that really beautiful, you know, near exponential form or does it look like something else? So we went back to the field of psychology where the um, accuracy of a person's memory is typically tested using what's called an NBAC task. And I'm going to show you an example of an NBAC task where N can be any number. Typically, uh, the task uses sort of two or three back. But if you train on this time task, you can remember seven back or eight back or et cetera, um, amazingly. Okay, so the goal is to determine in this stream of stimuli whether the current one that you are seeing before you is the same as the letter that happened two ago. So in this particular case, you're sitting at A and you have to remember, did A happen two moments ago? Yes or no? So if you say yes, you would be incorrect because A didn't happen two ago, B happened two ago. But maybe you said A because you mixed up these targets in your mind and you're remembering something way back here, delta T ago, instead of what actually happened, right? So we can look at everyone's errors on the two back working memory task and estimate that delta T and look at the probability of each delta T. So we can basically what I showed you, um, oops, here, this P of T, this probability of delta T, we can measure that in real people um, while they're performing a two back task. So this is the data. So here's the probability of um, remembering something delta T ago instead of what actually happened. And you can see the shape of that as you fall off with delta T. This is for when you do a one back task, when you do a two back task, and when you do a three back task. And then this figure down here is when you put all of it together, one back, two back, and three back. Um, what you can see, first of all, is that you have this very nice fall off with time and the beta value that best fits that data is 0.32. What's fascinating about this is that we can compare that to what happened in the network learning task, where we found that the majority of people had a beta value of 0.31. So in other words, in two completely different human tasks, very, very different um, requirements. We, and we gather consistent evidence, not just for the shape of the memory distribution, but also the actual beta value that humans have. Um, so that's really exciting. That's an initial validation of the phenomenological theory. Now, we also want to use the theory to test a prediction in a new experiment. So let's make a prediction and then let's test it. So what I want you to focus now on this ring graph. I haven't shown you a ring graph before, but here is a ring graph and I'm going to make my prediction on this ring graph. If humans were doing something like maximum likelihood estimation, which we know they're not, but if, we, if they were, then we would assume that if we showed them transitions that they had never seen before, they should be equally surprised by any transition because any violation of this structure has never happened before, right? Okay, but if in contrast, humans are building a biased representation of the transition probability matrix um, using this kind of fuzzy temporal integration that the beta value gives you, then they should be more surprised by long violations than by short violations. What do I mean by a long and short violation? A short violation would be they've been trained on this graph and now we show them instead of a white node going to the green one, we'll show them instead a white one going to a blue. White has never gone to blue before. They've never seen that happen before. But if they are smoothing things out, um, the way the um, free energy model would predict, then they would have some expectation that white is closer to blue than white is to red. So if we show them the transition white to red, they'll be more surprised than if we show them the transition from white to blue. And that would be true if humans are obeying the um, free energy model, not true if they were obeying the maximum likelihood estimation. So here's the data. Along the y-axis here is a change in reaction time. And the first fig, uh, box plot shows you their reaction time to short violations, so from white to blue, versus no violations. So the fact that this is above zero just tells you that if you see something you've never seen before, you slow down. And that's, that's very normal, healthy, typical human behavior. And then the red bar here is the reaction time for a long violation versus no violation. So again, if you see something you've never seen before, you slow down. 
the crux for distinguishing the two models is in purple. So this is where we show them that we compare their reaction time in a long violation versus a short violation. And what we find is that this bar is significantly above zero, which means they're slower when we show them a long violation than when we show them a short one. So that means that they're not treating each of these elements in the network as kind of independent local units. They're blending in their mind the structure so that they understand distances between items and are more surprised by longer distances than by shorter distances. Okay, that then brings me to the very last sort of section that I wanted to um, present to you. And I wanted to motivate this last section with a passage from Joseph Glanville's The Vanity of Dogmatizing, which he published in 1661. And he writes, but how is it and by what art doth the soul read that such an image or stroke in matter signifies such an object? Did we learn such an alphabet in our embryo state? And how comes it to pass that we are not aware of any such cogent apprehensions? That by diversity of motions, we should spell out figures, distances, magnitudes, colors, things not resembled by them, we attribute to some secret deductions. And I love this for a lot of reasons, but it calls to mind how humans use symbolic representations to mean something. And I want to ask the question of whether and to what degree the laboratory experiments that I've just described to you are relevant to how we as humans communicate in symbols. So to address the question, by what art doth the soul read that such an image or stroke in matter signifies such an object, we are going to answer by the principles of human perception that generalize, not just from laboratory experiments, but across many different true information communication systems. And to sort of support that claim, I'm going to show you some real information processing networks and how people respond to them. So in this framework, what we want to do is to say, when you and I engage in communication systems, the amount of information that we perceive depends on how complex the information is. And then it also depends on how divergent our perception of that information is from the truth. So what I've just shown you in the last two sections of the talk is that when humans see information from a network, they don't perceive the truth. They typically perceive something that's a blurred version of the truth. They have a sort of biased representation of the truth. So now when I go into the real world, I am going to perceive the, in some degree the information that's presented to me, but in another part, I'm going to perceive how divergent that information is from what I would expect. So what I'm going to do now is to redefine the transition probability matrix as P. I had used A before in the earlier section, so I just wanna mark for you that instead of A, I'm using P on this slide. Um, so then we can state the perceived information as the cross entropy here, which is going to be equal to the actual entropy of the transition probability matrix, which is gonna be log of P. That's the amount of information that's produced. And then plus the KL divergence. So this is the inefficiency of the observer's representation. So P hat is what I perceive the network to be, but it's biased. And P is the truth. So the divergence between these two is some additional amount of information that I have to process in order to interact with my world. So the first thing that we can ask is, well, let's look at 805,491 K4 regular graphs. So first of all, it's beautiful that there are 805,000 K4 regular graphs. I just think that's amazing still, um, of size uh, 15 nodes and 30 edges. Wow. Um, but then for each of those, we can find the amount of entropy that they have. And that's a consistent number because it's entropy is just um, log of the degree and they're all K4 regular. So we know what the degree is. It's all the same. Um, but then we can also measure the KL divergence given this free energy model of human perception. And what you can see is that the modular graph that I've been showing you over and over in these slides is the one that has the lowest KL divergence. So in other words, it is the one that is the most forgiving of human biases. So perhaps that is why humans were responding so much more swiftly to the modular graph than they were to the other graphs that we tried. Um, so the next question is, well, let's look across many different information processing systems and ask to what degree they show 
entropy and what is their KL divergence? And are any of them kind of as forgiving of our human biases as that simple modular graph is? So we studied language networks, specifically word transition probabilities in Shakespeare, Homer, Plato, Jane Austen, uh, William Blake, Miguel de Cervantes, and Walt Whitman. We also studied semantic relationships. We studied the World Wide Web. We studied citations as kind of a marker of um, scientific information transmission. We studied social relationships as a proxy for the um, sharing of social information. And then we also studied music and specifically note transition probability matrices in a couple um, more recent pieces and then some classical music from Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Bach, and Brahms. And so what we did first is to measure how much entropy they each had and then how large was the KL divergence. I just want you to focus on the left hand side of the slide first. So here is along the x axis is the entropy of the real system, the real communication system. And then along the y axis is the entropy of a random system of the same size. The dashed gray line is the unity line. So that means the same amount of entropy in the real and the random networks. But what and the true data is in color. So all I want you to notice is that all of the color data points are below the unity line. And what that means is that all of these true communication networks have higher entropy than expected in a random graph of the same size. Okay, and that's expected. These are systems that are used for communication. We would expect them to have high entropy and then to pack in a lot of information. Okay, now I want you to focus on the right hand side of this slide. Um, along the x-axis is the KL divergence of the real network, and along the y-axis is the KL divergence of the random network of the same size. Again, in the dashed gray line is the unity line, and the data points, all I want you to notice is that they're all above the unity line. So what that means is that all of these true communication systems have lower KL divergence than expected in a random graph of the same size. So that suggests that they pack in a lot of information without inducing a lot of additional processing costs. They're kind of very forgiving in their architectures to our human biases. Now, um, if you want to look inside the paper, that, that sort of combination of high entropy and low KL divergence is made possible by a hierarchically modular structure. I'm not going to go into that for the sake of time, um, but if you're curious, it's in the paper. The last thing that I wanted to do is just to pull apart that same data, but by the different kinds of networks we studied. So this is exactly what you saw on the previous slide, but just replotted so that you can see language separate from semantic networks, separate from the web, separate from music. And along the top part of the um, figure, you see the real entropy minus the entropy of a random network. So the higher that bar is, the more entropy is present in the real system. And then the bottom part is the KL divergence of the real graph minus the KL divergence of a random graph. So the deeper that bar, um, the more uh, uh, KL divergence the system has. So I just want you to notice that language is really strikingly high in entropy. This is a network that has a lot of information, which is sort of expected because language is something that we use to communicate a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, and then I want to contrast that over here with music networks, which as you can see have significantly less entropy. Um, so are not packing in quite as much information. And the music networks, interestingly, have greater KL divergence than the language networks. So that means they're departing from our expectations more. And I think that this is really interesting because I think that music is something that we often use for entertainment and for enjoyment. And in some cases, novelty and surprise and the lack and unexpected events are, are wanted in music and uh, sometimes less wanted in language when we're just trying to accurately communicate um, the information that we want to share with one another. So I think this is interesting. It suggests that you know, many real world, world networks are constrained by the pressures of information transmission, but that those pressures may be, um, may be arbitrated differently in each of these communication systems. So with that, I wanted to just summarize what we've done this morning over the last sort of 45 minutes. Um, we started by saying that humans can learn the architecture of networks underlying continuous st streams of information. 
Then we showed that humans display expectations that diverge from the true network, indicating that they're not performing maximum likelihood computations, they're doing something else. Then we posited the free energy principle, that the human mind is attempting to minimize errors and computational complexity. That produced this memory distribution, which is the Boltzmann distribution, that's consistent with the empirical measurements from traditional psychology tests. And then finally, we showed that real networks are organized to communicate large amounts of information, having high entropy, and to do so relatively efficiently with low KL divergence from human expectations. And this is made possible by hierarchical modularity. So here's a pictorial representation of what we did over the last few minutes. So we started with um, Robert McFarlane, who's a nature writer. We went through network learning experiments. We took a transition across Arthur Benson, who's an essayist and poet, into network learning theory. Then we transitioned across Joseph Glanville into human information processing. And I would be remiss not to mention the people who led all of this work. So it began with Liz Caruza and Ari Khan. Um, Liz was at the time a postdoc in the lab and Ari was a um, uh, graduate student. And then the um, physics work, the computational model and the extension to real communication systems was done by Chris Lynn, who at the time was a graduate student in the lab in physics and is now a James S. McDonnell um, Foundation Fellow. Liz is now an assistant professor of psychology at Penn State and Ari is now a postdoc at Princeton. And so with that, um, I would love to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for listening.